Honey, I blew up the business. Welcome to the podcast, live from NYC. We have NYC, Nicole Yershon in the house. Yay! Woo! Really happy to be here. No, I'm I'm really happy you're here because uh, Nicole is a legend, a rock star, and a, a bit, I'm a big fan of hers just for various reasons, which we will get into. Uh, and a, and, a, and a, you know, I'm really um, keen to have her on the podcast because she's she's a real mover and shaker in various worlds, but she's known. I'm going to embarrass you now, Nicole. Okay. She's known as the disruptor's disruptor. <laughs> I read that on somebody's website about you. Seriously, I love that. Yeah. I'm they, in the direction of who wrote that. Uh, well, I will. I'll dig it out. I, I might sort of, in my Googling of you, I found that one. I thought you'd like that. But <laughs> she's, she's, a, she's a mover and shaker and disruptor and a change maker. She's the founder and CEO of the NY Collective. That's right. Nicole Yershon Collective, and she's working on the front line of innovation across the piece. She's got a real history in the ad industry, but that's not just where she works. The creative intersection between advertising, media, technology, marketing, and change in general, culture perhaps, uh, aka, and this is really what she does, brings organizations kicking and screaming into the 21st century. I do. I do. She does. She started doing that at Ogilvy and Mather, which is one of the biggest, is that how you pronounce Mather, Mather? I think it's just Ogilvy now. So Is it Ogilvy? One of the how would you describe Ogilvy? Um a large corporate, let's say. Big advertising agency, global business. Yeah, it's kinda it's more Marcoms, so it's not just advertising, it's right. um, everything around that. It's, it's, it's one of the big ones, let's put it that way. And yeah, she, after yeah. leaving Ogilvy, and we'll get into what you did there, um, she has become a best selling author of a book called Rough Diamond, Turning Disruption into Advantage in Business and Life. And she's the original, the OG, Rough Diamond. <laughs> as, as she, and she's an expert on what she, uh, we call intrapreneurship, or she calls entrepreneurship. So creating busi- businesses or business ideas within other businesses. She's an international speaker, teacher, mentor, coach, legend. And, um, and the Drum Magazine, which is Europe's biggest marketing magazine, named Nicole as one of the 25 women who have shaped British digital industry over the last 25 years. They did. They did, because she's, I told you she's a legend. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to get into all that. But I, I, I want to remind everybody that this podcast is brought to you by my company, The Tech Department, which is the one I blew up. Uh, Nicole and I met each other through The Tech Department. So in 2017, I blew it up. Or we all had a big nightmare year, and we did turn it around. So The Tech Department is still going. But I don't want to do that again. That's why I'm speaking to Nicole, because I'm trying to learn what the bloody hell to do. <laughs> and so, so if you like that kind of mission, I want to help other people like you listening how to run a business better so you don't blow it up. Um, please share the episode today. Share um, uh, the podcast with your, with your friends and like it and, and kind of do all that good stuff because it helps other people because obviously the algorithm picks up that people are liking it. So review us on Apple and all that good stuff. Um, and that will really help us help other people like you. Um, so I'm going to go uh, get into it with Nicole because she's got a really interesting career. I want to go back in time to the year 2000. Woo! We're zooming back in time like Doctor Who. And and um, Nicole, you were brought into this advertising agency called Ogilvy. It is a classic, traditional, big global TV, big campaign advertising agency, one of the sort of original advertising agencies. And you were told or asked by the chairman to bring the agency into the 21st century. So so I just, I was curious, what was, and for the people listening, what was the scale of that challenge? Um, well, the good thing was I'd worked with um, the, the CEO and chairman at, um, for many years at Gold Winnie's Trot. When I was there with Dave Trot, he was also there. And then he set up a company called Simon's Palmer, and I was there for nine years and did some great stuff there. So he trusted me. So, uh, and when he pulled me in with that job description, he didn't have any idea as to what it was that he wanted me to do. He just knew that he needed them brought into the 21st century, moving them from an analog world to a digital world, but didn't quite know how. And so it was my job really for the first three months to audit and just work out some some simple, um, quick fixes. Uh, and, and so th- there was a lot of trust there in the early days. 
And so it was three months worth of an audit and, and I picked out three areas, workflow systems, finance systems, and digital asset management systems, and then looked into how we could make that um, digital rather than analog. So it was very civil service. It was very much paper everywhere. It, job bags, things were written down, um, cash flow problems because loads of money was going out and um, estimates were done and invoices were sent out, um, and, but nothing was coming in and, and being paid. And so it was just really... It, it then started to look at, um, you know, the early days of digital distribution of, okay, so there's all these TV commercials flying around the world um, and there, there's tapes and couriers and how can we do that digitally? So digital delivery, get rid of tapes, get rid of couriers, um, get rid of paper basically. And so that was the, that was the real nasty getting stuck in, no one wanted the change. There's some kind of great stories that I, I talk about where uh, they were trying to not go through the digital route and still do it analog. And I found this printer machine, uh, this big DDS printer that was printing all these um, uh, invoices to, for people to go off and, and start working. And what was happening was that um, they weren't actually getting the estimate approved first. So I, I, one Friday night, I waited for everyone to go and then I, I gave it a Viking's burial. Um, and so, yeah. So, so, so hang on. So, so you gave it a Viking's burial. Explain what that meant. Blew it up, kind of um, sent it off into the water um, <laughs> in flames. <laughs> uh, and so they came in on the Monday morning and they were like, because they're like meerkats, like where's the DDS printer? I need to get work commissioned and, and done. And, and I'd thrown it away and um so really they had to use the system that i'd put in and, and move, literally move them off of an analog way of working so wow. that that was the real kind of um nasty stuff in the early days P tv departments saying uh phoning me up saying where's my tape and me saying i haven't sent it go to your post house and pull it down digitally and um them screaming at me you're going to make me miss my air date and i said well you know you're just going to have to find another way to do it. So literally cutting off the old way to enable the new way to do it. That's where it was really difficult in the early days in 2000. So, so you, so, okay, so, okay, so you're at the start of this process, you're in there in early, fresh in 2000, yeah. you've got the nod yeah. from the chairman. So that's good. But then you've got this swathes of other people yeah. who don't want you to be there slash yeah. don't want to change. Yeah, and you're you've done your audit, and you know you're, you're focusing on these three areas, and you've got a plan. And I thought I was interested that you, you you sort of this this a woman prepared to burn a printer is unleashed <laughs> into the civil service of Ogilvy. Yeah, but two things, two things here. One, what was going through your mind on the first day? You know, when you were you got the seal of approval, you got your plan approved. Yeah. What was what was in your mind, or what, what was what, how are you feeling? Excited, I excited about possibilities because I'd seen all these other things happening. So I, I saw say with, um, there was an edit facility within Ogilvy and they were using Avid, these huge Avid machines. And, I, and it was the start of Apple coming through and Final Cuts. And so I thought, okay, I'll rip all of those things out and I can put final cuts in and then we can, then phones will come through and we can do these things on the phone and then we can do digital delivery and not have to keep getting cabs to the mill in Soho when we're in Canary Wharf. And, and that will help the TV department not have to go backwards and forwards. And uh, I, so I was just excited about what I could see was coming tech wise um, about how it was going to make life easier. But I wasn't prepared and so much for, for the backlash of how they didn't want their life. They didn't want to go through the pain to then get to where their life was going to be easier. But I worked it out. It was only 12 weeks of pain. So when you're implementing these new systems, it's almost like when you have a new baby and you've got to go through the, the pain of not sleeping for three months. It's that same kind of pain um, amount of time. But once they get through it and once you kind of stand your ground and you've got that buy-in, um, then I was just excited of, of what we could achieve. I could only see that end goal. 
so you're going all excited, all bullish and ready to make change. And, and you've got this, you're hitting a bit of a brick wall though. So there's there's all these yeah. intransigent types. So what was the kind of, you know, how did you go about overcoming that? I think um, it's very interesting actually, because later on in my time at Oga, because I was there for 16 years and I had this great life coach um, because I'm always, I always like to continue learning uh, not just with what's going on in the outside world and bringing it back, but also for myself. And she was, um, she said, we, you know, we really need to work on getting you out of your comfort zone. And I said, I'm always out of my comfort zone. I go to places I know no one, I know nothing. I bring all that information back. I sift through what's going to be relevant, not relevant. Um, and she said, yeah, but that's your comfort zone. I'm like, well, oh. Okay. So I said, so what is out of my comfort zone? She said, actually, we need to put in a little bit more empathy there because when you're going through change, imagine yourself as a tank and you're just starting your journey and you can see the end goal and you just want to get there. And you're going over all these flowers and all these fields to get to the other side. But actually imagine there the flowers in the field as people and you don't care. You're just getting there, you know, by hook or by crook. Actually, then there's another way, which is where you need to stop, think, be patient. And she gave me other skills that I hadn't even really thought about. It's not that I'm, I, I lack empathy. I was just so focused on the change that I didn't take into account. Maybe people can't all come at the same time. I was thinking you either on the bus or fuck off. Uh, when actually there are other ways to do it with change to make people feel like they're coming with you. Um, and but not take up all your time and energy in trying to change everyone all the time, um, but just find the ones that you can that come with you on the journey, and then a, um, a domino effect. So how do you figure that out between your tank-like nature and squishing uh, squ squishing people under the tracks? Um, I went through emotional intelligence testing. So I put my whole team. I said to HR, uh, I want to find out who works best with who who are ready, who's not, uh, what my strengths are, my weaknesses are, uh, if they're my weaknesses, who has strengths to combat them. And so I made the team um, this kind of holocratic team where there was no one in charge of anyone. Uh, but our strengths and weaknesses started to, we really started to understand ourselves much better and a strong sense of self in understanding that someone can't get up at seven in the morning and then function really well and be happy throughout the day. So her hours were changed to uh, come in at half 11 and then work and do what you can. Someone else in the team um, didn't want to work on Fridays, but wanted to work from home. So we changed it so that he did a four day week in the office and one day was working from home. So we were doing all of that in 2000 we were understanding that actually you needed diversity of thinking, which is why we set up the Rough Diamond program. You can't, you know, that over we were always hiring the same people. And I won't necessarily say it's, ne it's a color thing because it could be a, a black or a brown person thinking in the same way as a white person because they've all gone through Oxbridge. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking of, I want someone from Hackney uh, who, who, whose mother might be holding down three jobs, whose father is an alcoholic and has left. And I wanted that kind of divergent thinking. So Rough Diamond program was set up, but all of these things were set up, uh, as responses to problems I encounter and then finding ways forward. Interesting. So you've kind of come in the tank pursuing these goals and it's i guess the original digital transformation yeah. or a original form of digital transformation i'm actually on a systemic level changing how people operate their jobs which perhaps right. have been the same or very similar for 20 30 years oh. and you're having you're learning on that path skills i guess technical but also emotional soft skills that they yeah. always call soft skills but actually we're starting to see more and more that they are highly prized skills. And why, why are they highly prized skills? Or why did you find they were highly prized to you? Or were they highly prized to you? Because you couldn't affect change properly from the core and, unless you, you understood people and how to get the best out of people and what motivated them and, and what, what made them work better. 
Interesting. So, so you, you're kind of plowing your furrow with your tank over at, at Ogilvy, and then I, I bound. I think it was 2008 ish. You set up the lab. Yeah. So, what describe what that was, and, and what, what what led to that? So, on the journey of transformation, um, and I implemented all these different changes like with the edit facility and digital delivery and um, uh, etc. And things were trucking along. And what I started to notice was just an absolute explosion of technology um, and gaming, mobile, social, AR, VR, big data, three D printing, behavior change. Um, just it was going mad and there was no one within Ogilvy who understood any of those spaces and how we could look at a different business model so that we weren't always doing TV press and posters and we could actually start making money in these other areas but we didn't really know who to go to or, or what the skills were or how we could bring that in to, to work holistically with all of these other mediums. So um, it, I kind of suggested to them be a really nice idea if, if I set up a, like an innovation lab to bring the outside world in and also start to build partnerships and relationships and different business models, and, um, but also train the people up within Ogilvy and train our clients of a different world that was happening that advertising had never kind of stepped into. Um, and I, again, I've, got, I've always had amazing buy-in with, with the kind of C-suite. And they said, yeah, why don't you go for it? But there's no money. Uh, we can pay you a salary, but I, we, you know, we can't give you any money to set up an innovation lab. So I said, that's fine. And that's where I then came up with other entrepreneurial or entrepreneurial ideas where I said, well, Rory Sutherland is, is, I've seen him speak at client meetings. Maybe I can act as his agent. Maybe I could then get in money for him to talk. And the money that um, I get in comes into our lab R&D pot. And then I don't need to ask for money from you. I can just start to make my own uh, way within the organization as to what I think is relevant or not and not go with my begging bowl each time. Um, and so I just learn entrepreneurial ways to make money for the lab but it not be a cost center apart from the you know the, the space and salary um and and start to kind of look at other ways that it would was bringing in um i used to call them the six r's so it would bring in reputation uh recruitment of new staff um, relationships with all these partnerships. And so I, I've kind of written down um, a theory as to how you can um, be measured on success where it's not just revenue and, and money attributed um, to a client. Therefore, you know, you've got the money covering your head. Therefore, you can stay. So I lasted really well in that way, knowing that it needed to be an R&D facility and uh, knowing that I needed to hit those six R's um, in measure of success until a new CEO came in who just didn't see, have my vision or have the vision of the last kind of 16 years worth of CEOs. Um, they just saw a, a spreadsheet and needing to cross off an amount of money and then just closed it and deleted everything that we'd ever done. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah, she did. So we first met in, I think, 2015-ish. Because my company was doing a lot of work in that kind of world of technology, innovation, um, creative technology. And so 2015, 2016, or well, prior to this, is, so 2016 was when the lab was closed. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. 2015 was just, because I, I remember this vividly when it happened. Because at the t so 2015, in the run up to this, you guys were, let's say, flagship. Smashing it. Flagship innovators in and around town, around yeah. London town. Not just London, we, we were pushing out, we saw talent in Newcastle with Thinking Digital, in, in Bournemouth with Silicon Beach, in, Bar, in Bristol with Pervasive Media Studios and Watershed. No, we, we, we moved ourselves around the world brilliantly. Mm, you, but you were the kind of, in fact, just give us a flavour for the kind of projects you were working on, the sort of clients you were working with in that sort of run up to the 2016 switch off time. Well, we just won gold can lions and light and, and uh, awards everywhere for um, something we did for 
the unit that was that labs had put money into to set it up to do the website and for behavior change and that unit's still going now over the change uh, that kind of wouldn't have been around had the labs not started really um and we run we um did something called um the power of cute and it was working with greenwich council and it was um painting babies' faces on shop shutters in Woolwich to help them to then measure on that street where the crime rate had gone down because babies' faces make people feel calmer, and it, and it did by about 17%. So that was what they really needed to really boost setting up this um, Ogilvy Change Department about behaviour change and behaviour economics. And we that literally just three of us, four of us set that up to be done within Ogilvy. And even the creative director at the time said, I don't want it entered into awards. And I had to then go to his boss and say, he's being a C-U-N-T, he doesn't have the vision that we have. And I know <laughs> we know that that is going to pick up everything. It's smart thinking. It's the way the, of the future. And his boss said, you work for the group, Nick, go to one of the other Ogilvy companies so I went to another creative director, another one of the Ogilvy companies, and they said, yeah, we'll back it. So we made the films and we put them in for awards and it literally cleaned up. Wow. Yeah. So, so you guys, I mean, just on that particular point, that is a, a sort of origin moment that's worthy of note because people or well, nerds around things like nudge the book and and the the, the yeah. nudge unit in the government yeah. all came from arguably the the work that rory sutherland and, and the yeah. behavioral change team were doing at ogilvy so this this these so so what you facilitated and enabled and made real had ripple effects that impact us through the lockdown i mean this is the whole behavioral science team that were yeah. th doing the three-step messaging and all that kind of stuff so yeah. this is this is change that has been had a profound impact so so you guys were doing this sort of stuff and leading this sort of stuff and, and doing these unbelievable sort of lateral thinking projects as forms of innovation on, on a public uh, and, and private level and winning awards for it and then and then it got to 2016 and then I remember this because we were doing some work with you and your team or uh, working alongside in the same world. And then the, there was an off switch. So it seemed to be very much on and then very quickly off. And there was a tweet, which I'm going to sort of quote back to you, where you said, quotes, it's with regret that labs has been shut down. Yeah. And I thought that was a beautifully understated thing that you put out onto the internet, because I'm knowing you, you weren't saying that in the pub. So what was going through your head when this yeah. whole thing was turned off? That was very instrumental, that tweet, because that was me taking control back of the narrative. Because when the CEO cut it, they wanted me, she wanted me to, to go with the story, their narrative, which was Nicole in true entrepreneurial fashion is leaving Ogilvy and we're so sad and, um, and you know, everything she's done has been amazing, but she want, kind of wants to move on to other things. I'm like, no, I don't. I love this job. You're shutting it down. Let's just be honest about it. Let's not do the whole me sign an NDA and be paid off to, to lie for the rest of my life. Um, and so I took, and I, so I'd got a lawyer involved and there was lots of discussions with my dad at the time. And um, I just remember thinking, I cannot sit and talk to someone in an, um, who I've known forever and say, oh, yeah, it was time for me to leave. I just can't do that. So I'm just going to sign nothing, take no money and leave with nothing. Um, and so me sending that out was the first moment of I'm just going to be honest and um, and not be paid off. I love that. I, I, I did, I, so you were you were taking a stand. Yeah, it makes me feel very emotional even now that it was it had got to that point. It was very sad. And this is kind of what I mean actually, because I'm knowing some of the emotional kerfuffle around in the the world in which you were in, and you and and that tweet being relatively polite. And I'm just interested because I know that this so it's emotive now. But what was what was the what were the emotions then? I mean, when when it happened and, and this sort of you know you you kind of can articulate it now. But what was going through your mind? Well, this is it's going to sound uh, you know, and I go through all of this in in my book. It's it's um, but that was actually the third thing that had happened that 
where shit had seriously hit the fan in my life. I, I'd gone through um, divorce, was just buying, bought my ex out of the house. So I had a mortgage up to here uh, and now no job. My mum had been diagnosed with terminal cancer. Uh, and so, there, I mean, there's no coming back from that. It, it is what it is. I've been the first person in my life who kind of, uh, where I'd had to go through that trauma. And I've been with my ex-husband since I was 14. So trauma of divorce, trauma of my mum, trauma of lamps going, which was like my baby. I'd built it from, from nothing with these beautiful people that we'd kind of found along the way. And I just, if there was one thing that I'd learned from my parents is just gracious be grateful and be gracious and there's no point slagging anyone off because everyone has their reasons for doing things um and the ceo's reason actually she did she stayed in employment there three months la uh, later she she had left hmm. so she left over it's like shut down the lab and then fucked off <laughs> um, but i understand business so i understand she's looking at she's got shareholders breathing down her neck She's the money is drying up. She is hitting the fan with that industry and she's cutting costs. So she thinks she's doing everyone a favor by keeping them in employment because they're attached to a client and attached to money. And she thinks it's much better to save money with getting with short term thinking, with getting rid of the lab. So I didn't want to start getting into um, the messy area of why, because I understand why. I just wanted to be honest, but gracious. And I was the same with my divorce. I never went through lawyers. I split everything down the middle. I never slagged them off to my kids. I, I just, and that's, that kind of really helped me going through that process. It helped me be more kind of grown up about what was happening more eloquent uh, when it happened with the lab. Yeah, it's interesting that the value from your, your parents about being gracious. Yeah, you, you fell back on, or the fallback that, that you stood on. There was a yeah. bedrock for you in that moment, because it'd be very easy not to be gracious. You know, there's yeah. lots of you could windmill swinging with your arms that could have been done at the injustice of the situation. And so, so you, looking back now, what do you think the kind of what were the things that got you through that period? Because that's you say the trauma of all these things happening all at the same time. What, what were the the, the the sort of values or the or the, the the aspects of your character that got you through? I think the line on my book, um, turning disruption into advantage. That's just what I do naturally. I, I won't go down that vortex. I just manage to keep myself at a level where I just keep moving forward. So I, I did a couple of things. I did something called Hatch in Montana. I, I did a talk in India, um, which I'd already committed to when I was at Ogilvy. I did um, something called Summit at Sea, which is like this mad event where you, all these 3,000 people get put onto a boat in, uh, the, uh, in the ocean. And it's like a Ted meets Davos meets Burning Man. Uh, and, and so I did a couple of things like that. I did something called I Discover, and I just spent my time putting feelers out into spaces that were very um, uncomfortable to, for me. Going to Hatch in Montana was like kind of planes, trains, and automobiles to get there. You know, the flight, the connecting, the connecting flight to get to Bozeman, the journey from Bozeman to um, in, in Montana to the event. It was... You know, these things, when people see pictures on Instagram and think, oh, that's amazing, she's got an amazing life. But the effort to get there and say yes is is not easy. And I didn't know anyone. So I think I did those things and I put those things in place. And then, weirdly enough, on the boat, I met this, I was in a jacuzzi and I met this publisher. He said, who are you? And I said, I'm Nicole from Nicole. Like I'm, I'm a nobody, <laughs> whereas it used to be Nicole from Ogilvy. And, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and he, he said, oh, my God, you've got some amazing stories. You should write it down. I'm, an, I'm a publisher, and I think it would be a really inspiring story for people, that the, the good and the bad. And so I said, I'm not a writer. And he said, no, I'm, you know, let's stay in touch. And so if I met him in – if the lab closed in the September and I met him in the November – and we arranged for him to come to London because he lived in California in the January. And my mum died in the January. 
So I phoned him up and said, listen, it's not going to happen and I can't do this book. He said, but your mum knew you were going to write a book. So then I thought, oh my God, so now I'm going to have to write a book. And so, but writing the book, and I did that from the February to the July, very, very methodically, because I am a get shit done person. Uh, but the the being able to get it out um, was actually quite cathartic. Mm, okay. So yeah, there's a period here of September 2016, the business blows up, as it were. Yeah. The lab blows up. And you're kind of out on your ass, basically. Exit, stage right. I'll see you later. Yeah. And you, you're having to cope with that whilst the divorce is happening, which is an emotional turmoil, whilst you're navigating that whole thing with your children and your family, and then your mum and the situation yeah. with her and the terminal illness. And it, and then you've got this period of like, I'm in a jacuzzi in a boat. <laughs> <laughs> like bit, which is like, cool. <laughs> and then it gets this sort of, it, it, it's, but there's this year. I'm just, just, just I'm dialing this back, sorry, because this September, this, so you've got this period of time when sort of, let's call it October, November, December-ish, where you're out around the world, yeah. throwing yourself into it. So, how did the, so you went from a period of being um, Nicole from Ogilvy, and everyone's heard of Ogilvy because it's a big yeah. company that goes around the world, and now you're Nicole from just, you're just some bird from London. Yeah, <laughs> Nicole from Nicole. No, Nicole from Nicole. So, so, so what's... How did you feel though when you were kind of going out to these the, these big events with all these big people as this new naked Nicole? Uh, you don't have this sort of thing. That, so what was going on then? Well, you feel incredibly vulnerable. You're trying to get your footing down, but then there was a part of me that just had this fuck it attitude because I'd never had that level of freedom, freedom from marriage freedom from a, a, a nine to five day job, uh, freedom from my kids were that much older. And I actually was the first time I could have a little bit of movement. Um, so that I guess helped me. That's the, I could have gone the other way, but I just see the positives uh, and I'm an optimistic personality. And it, I, I just didn't allow myself to fall down that, Pit. I don't know why I didn't. Maybe my personality type, you know, the Myers Briggs, you know, ENFP or w whatever. I, I'm really not sure. Or maybe it was during that time I had the right help. I dis I discover was was really good for me. It was looking at oneself um, and looking at who you are, and 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 I'd done a little bit of coaching before that. So all those things helped to take responsibility for who I am and my decision making. So I guess in answer to your question, those things were put in place um, and guided me and helped me keep it um, moving forward. Interesting. So, so, you, so you're so soaking in all this sort of inf all these influences and yeah. information, and guess not allowing yourself to go down a wormhole. And then you've got this the, the the death of your mother at the same time of the birth of the book. Yeah. And it's interesting how there's a sort of um, I know you've spoken about serendipity before mm. and it's interesting looking at it this is year september through july yeah where old nicole the identity the job the family structure the lots of things faded wow. away or went away yeah blew up and then new nicole started to be born yeah. looking back now because it's a few years ago now yeah how does that how does that feel you know that, that time and can you you know make sense of it and what's the sort of serendipitous nature threading through that but obviously not about my mom, but uh, everything else was, thank God. Oh, my God, they did me a favor. I didn't even know it. it took me a while to get through that. But looking back, they, they are my feelings because now could I work with, like uh, have a, a nine-to-five job working for um, companies and, and I, 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 I couldn't now. I, I'm so used to being like going from an entrepreneur to the entrepreneur. Um, I, I thank them for allowing me to do that and how much money has been put in my pension as a result of running my own business and stuff that I would, I would have just been a salaried employee. Um, I wouldn't have learned what I've learned about finance 
and and running my own company and money coming in and money going out and and business acumen has just gone sky high because in comparison to working for someone else you don't know how to run a business um so that in in terms of um has really really helped uh, and the marriage thing i was lit being married was living the same day, the same year, the same month, every day, the same day and calling it a life. You know, I have my diary. I'd see things booked up for in six months on Saturday nights and they'd be, it'd be the same Saturday night, the Friday night dinner, the, the Sunday deli, the whatever it was. I, I was not, now I just say yes to everything just for, and people might again, look at the Instagram and think, oh, she's got a great life. I make that by making certain choices. Like, so I'm in New York for five weeks, but I'm up at five o'clock in the morning, most mornings for meetings and calls. So from five until two, I'm working. I'm just working from anywhere. I'm just working from New York. So it might look like I'm having the whale of a time, and I am, but I make those choices to, to have that, um, have those moments so I'm not living the same day over and over again and 10 years down the line and all of a sudden I'm 10 years older and and I don't have those experiences to show for it. Yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's, you've really embraced the change and the the, the, the the switch up of that time and yeah. sort of and, and live it out. And so you're working from anywhere. You were, you literally are dialing in from NYC. And so, yeah. so, what, how, so how are you, so, so is this the thing you're doing now? Is this just sort of an opportunity you've taken um, to, to, to be out there? Are you working from anywhere all the time or, or just? No, for I just thought, well, my partner does a lot of work in North America. So, you know, he'll have, uh, uh, he'll have to go, he's been to Washington, uh, and then he could come back to New York as a base. He's going to Chicago for a job, and then he'll come back to New York as a base. So rather than flying back to London, backwards and forwards, we just thought, well, let's just see what it could be like where New York would be his base, as he has loads of stuff here anyway. And what would it be like for me in terms of um, how can I still run my business working with my clients uh, and we've been doing it on Zoom for the last couple of years anyway, haven't we? So it doesn't actually feel very odd that they see me on a screen. Yeah, very true. And it's interesting because we've been, we went fully remote as a business and well, early in lockdown, because frankly, there was no point renewing the lease. It was very, yeah. very apparent. But this idea of working from anywhere is something that we've sort of threatened, threatened a little bit and I'm not really done it. So I'm intrigued to see how you're find, finding it in practice. I love it. I absolutely love it. And I would do it again over and over again um, because I think you make it work. Uh, and as long as uh, it's fine with everyone else, like I've said to them, don't change the meeting times. I'll just fit in with how, you know, if the meeting's at 10 o'clock and it's been set every Wednesday, then I'll just dial in at five in the morning. Uh, you know, I, and, and you just kind of make it work. So, um, and five weeks we kind of felt was a long enough period of time for us to see whether it, it, it does work. Um, and I found a great, like, great little ways to save money. So we, we flew from Paris rather than London and, and saved a fortune with airfare. Now mm. it's a pain to go on Eurostar, go to Paris, stay overnight at the airport, hotel and then fly from Paris but it's so it was so much cheaper I've done the same with I found something called Sonda um which is um, it's not Airbnb and it's not a hotel so you're living in this kind of turnkey apartment um and you keep it clean you don't have maids come in or anything and um and you get your own grocery shopping and and you literally live your life in an, a, a turnkey apartment where you can stay for one day three months, five weeks, and it feels like home. Mm. So you got home from home? Yeah. Over in New York for five weeks. That's interesting. How long have you been there? I mean, we came on the 2nd of April, and we leave on the, the 8th of May. 
So we're recording this in, well, I mean, it's not going to go out until a bit. So mid- middle of April. So interesting. So I'm, I'm going to, uh, I'm, I'm inspired. I'm going to start oh, looking at, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fancying a bit of that. That's, that's great. So you've got this amazing sort of life doing entrepreneurial innovation stuff with big companies. And what, what's the sort of, give us an inside sort of projects you're working on now and how you're using these skills that you, and, and that you've built over these years to, to sort of help drag more companies into the 21st century. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've got lots of experience in terms of, so I was working with Danone for a while and I did a a big project and a big budget and it was kind of pulling all of the the right teams together depending on what it was that we were trying to do. Uh, But they wouldn't allow to pay for anyone else other than me. So I was the holder of this budget and that was the first experience of someone who I pulled in from the collective invoices me and wants to be paid within a week someone invoices and wants to be paid within a month. And yet they didn't pay me for maybe 60 days. So it was, so then now working with another client, I said to the finance director, we've got maybe 10 different companies that we're working with over on this project. I'm not going to hold the purse strings and I'm not going to take, you know, so therefore they pay me retainer and but then they've got to pay these companies exactly when they say they want to be paid no 60 day or 90 day or how it's been um with these uh come with smes and how they get paid and uh, because most of them get crushed with cash flow quite um so and the good thing was i've never had a an office space since i've left ogilvy but i always work from soho house so having that membership there's three soho houses here So, and plus Sonda, um, it is a a building with a gym and with meeting room space. Right. Okay. So I've I've kind of looked around and and really kind of made sure that it's going to fit into the life that that I'm living. So that was good experience with Danone in working out um, how we should get paid. But I've been working with small companies as well. So I was working um, at the beginning of the year with the Young Vic and I was instrumental in helping set up a mentorship program for them. So it was mentoring the mentors who were mentoring the mentees, but it was a reverse mentorship program. So the mentors were the kids and the mentees were people that run their own companies, like very senior people. So it was great because I could help the mentors with any kind of imposter syndrome because they thought, what can I um, tell these people who've been running the show for ages, but they, they, cause they couldn't understand what they were giving to the met to the mentees in terms of their age, their generation, their thought process, their inspirations, um, events that they've been to that, uh, we would never have heard of how they go about doing their, um, business and their work, how they work on Google docs and like all of these different things. It was a, an amazing program to see the the mix of, um, learning. So that was quite interesting. I'm working on a, on a, a lab for a vet company that are building a, a vet hospital of the future with a brand new business proposition. So, the insight was that they were finding vets were killing themselves uh, quite literally over COVID um, times because they hadn't been trained to deal with people. They're trained to deal with animals. And then they've got the financial element on top of it, and they haven't really been trained on that either. And therefore people are saying, you know, their animal needs to be put down and that's going to be a thousand pounds and that level of conversation. It just... um, so this is a new business model. It's a new uh, vet school that is going up within um, Keel University. And then with that, we'll attach a lab and we'll have um, various things in there as to how we can teach the kids that are coming through that five-year program, but also how we can um, teach the, um, the, the people and, and the vets that are, are within the hospital. So all very different. Yeah, it's amazing, and I think it's interesting to get a, a flavour of, of different ways of thinking about not just 
new technology, but new ways of working, new ways of engaging with other people, new ways of thinking about dealing with problems. And so I think this is so. So I would very much encourage everyone to to. to but sniff out what Nicole's up to because she's got a really amazing view of the world, which I think anyone um, running a company, an, an entrepreneur or, or someone within a business can learn from in terms of looking at the world differently. And that's what innovation really is or disruption is, is change. I like to ask people this question just to sort of uh, before we finish up. So there's lots of advice for entrepreneurs out there. What, what advice should entrepreneurs ignore? The word no, because there's always someone somewhere that can help unless it fundamentally is really not working and and you've been patient and you've given it time. But um, I think most entrepreneurs have the ability that we're super connectors. So if we don't know, we know someone that does. And so um, there's normally someone who can help and will give their time, not have the piss taken out of them, but um, there's, I mean, like my friend, um, you know her, Katie Bell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Katie sent me a note this morning saying, gave me an update on all the different things she's doing. And I've maybe connected her to five different people where her skills and what she's doing right now are extremely relevant. And she's written back saying, please, how can I help you? And I said, well, there, there's nothing right now, but I don't know what's going to happen in the future. So let's just stay talking. And, and so that's how we work together we um entrepreneurs in general is like, i know i can call upon someone who like, or even you i we, when was the last time we saw each other maybe six years oh ago, yeah probably ago. yeah like quite a while ago but there's a re, there's a respect and an and a um and value where we there's a where we understand um how to do business which is decency and kindness and and our value system seem to work so in answer to your question, what advice wouldn't they listen to? Or should they ignore? Should they ignore? I would say probably the word no, because anything is possible. I love it. Anything is possible. Today's T-shirt in the merch shop, which we we'll haven't <laughs> developed yet, is Anything is Possible by Nicole yeah. Yershon. Yeah. Well, listen, that's a fantastic, well, listen, it's low, what a great story. Thank you for sharing so openly and it's so inspiring. And so, and, and genuinely, I'm making notes about bloody flying to New York and working for five weeks. <laughs> so I'll see you, in, I'll see you, I'll see you next week. Um, yeah. uh, and, and where should people find you on online? Where, where should people come? I always say this and this, I thank my parents for this. There's no other Nicole Yershon. So there's literally only one. There's only one. <laughs> there's only one there's Nicole only Yershon. <laughs> It sounds so arrogant and ridiculous, but so therefore I just made everything Nicole Yershon. LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, website. Um, as long as obviously you can spell it, you, you'll find me and just reach out. We will put all these links into the description in the podcast yeah. and, and just Google it and you'll find her and she's and well worth checking out and connect with her and, and think of her when you're doing your next innovation project um what an absolute joy thanks for coming stay on the line when we stop finish stop chatting now and then um and uh, we'll see you all next time everyone bye thanks for having me my pleasure do you want to get the top five tidbits from each episode emailed to your inbox every friday yes you do it saves you having to go through and make notes and make a note of all the books and all the ideas that are in the podcast. We go through, we choose the top five we like, plus put all the links into that email. So if you just go up to honeyibleweupthebusiness.com, yes, that's honeyibleweupthebusiness.com, and just enter your email address. There's a little box, just enter it in, and we will send you that information. And it saves you having to make notes and all that. That's uh, make your life a bit easier. And of course, if you did enjoy the episode, please consider subscribing. We are trying to help people through this. So the more people that subscribe, review, rate on Apple, Google, Podcasts, Spotify, the more people will see it and the more we can help. So help us help other people, other entrepreneurs like you. And before I go, I've got to say big up to my company, the tech department, the company we blew up and put back together again. They're generously supporting me on this mission through the podcast. So if you guys want to have a look at a company that can really help you improve your technology, make it better so your business gets better too, boosting your sales and your profit and a bit more sanity in your life, a little less stress, 
then head up to the techdept.com, the tech department, uh, my company. Uh, give us a look. On behalf of all of us here, thank you for listening, and I'll see you next time. 